Talk a little bit about salt today. What do you think about when you think about salt? Your wife's cooking. Do you think about uh, hypertension? <laughs> Preserving things. Kind of, it brings out, you know, there's some things you just can't have without salt. A pretzel without salt is just a big burnt bagel. It's all tasty. It's not right. It's not right. You gotta have salt. Well, number one, Jesus made an interesting statement about salt. Jesus called us salt. Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. See, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on the stand. Let it shine for all. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. And Jesus said a few things here. Very interesting. Number one, He said it. We're the salt of the earth. We enhance the flavor of this place. Do you enhance the flavor of your life? Do people like to be around you? Yeah, everybody likes to be around me. I don't want to party. What do you like? I mean, when, when people are around you, do you make their lives better? What about your spouse? Make your spouse's life better? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a lot of things I could do that I don't do. But she is kind enough to inform me of those things. <laughs> to help me. Give me a road map to happiness. What about your kids? Are there ways that you can make their lives better? I don't want to preface that. By saying, before you do that, I'm not, I'm not asking about ways that you can make their lives easier. I'm asking about ways you can make their lives better. Because easier is not always better. Giving them what they want will just make them into horrible adults. But making their lives better is investing in them, spending time with them, loving them, talking to them, getting to know them. We should... We should have a flavor about us as Christians. As believers, there should be something about us that, that stands out. That, that people can notice a difference. What's the difference between somebody who believes in Christ and somebody who doesn't believe in Christ? If we're the salt of the earth, we need to add flavor. We need to enhance the flavor of whatever we do, wherever we're at. And Jesus said, if salt loses its flavor, what good is it? I remember uh, a few years ago, we used to have a big old swamp cooler. Does anybody have a swamp cooler? Oh, they're nice in the summertime. <coughs> but the swamp cooler was right in front of the dining room table. And we hadn't had a swamp cooler before. So we were excited. But the one thing we did was we left we always left the salt and pepper on the table. And do you know what a swamp cooler does to salt? Salt should be like right? Swamp cooler makes it go. And it gets all like pasty and big and, and uh, it loses its flavor. You know what we do with it? We throw it away. Trample it underfoot is worthless. And sometimes, sometimes Christians, sometimes Christians go, they do. Sometimes they lose their flavor. Sometimes.
sometimes Christians don't last as long as a stick of gum. You ever notice that you take a, take a piece of gum and you put it in your mouth and it just bursts with flavor? And then about five seconds later, you're chewing this giant ball of wax. There's, all you're doing is giving yourself TMJ at that point. Because there's nothing left. And there's a lot of Christians that get excited about God. They get passionate about God. They're going to change the world. And, and they're going to be the salt of the earth. And, and then all of a sudden, one day, something happens. Or they get hurt. Or they, they go through a situation. Or, or something occurs. And then all of a sudden, they lose their flavor. They lose their passion. They lose their joy. Jesus said we're the light of the world. This, this city that should be on, on a hill, on a mountain, so the whole world can see your light. <coughs> Don't hide it under a basket. But shine it. And he closed by saying this. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. When you do something, do it for the glory of God. And let that shine for Him. Be salt in somebody's life. But be salt that leads them to Christ. Be salt that leads them to God. And uh, <clears throat> it's... This is a dangerous thing because so many times in the church we try to manifest humility and we end up manifesting false humility. I, I hope you know what I'm talking about. Um, I had a friend that used to write, he used to write a lot of poetry and, and he would get up before he'd read a poem and, and the thing he was always afraid of is he was always afraid, man, if, if I get the glory for this, and it's not going to go to God. I want, to, I want to stop that right here. I want to make sure God gets the glory. So he would always get up, and he would say, I want you to know I don't write poetry. God writes poetry. Amen. And what you're about to hear comes entirely from God. And it's not from me. And to an extent, that kind of sounds good Christianese-wise. But I try to think outside the box. And, 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 and coming from outside of Christianese, when that guy does a poem, he just got up in front of everybody and said, this poem is perfect because God composed it. I didn't. And I think to myself, what if it's a really bad poem? <laughs> is he saying God's a bad poet? In a sense, sometimes we manifest false humility in order to be, you know, just, and this guy's doing it sincerely. He's just trying to be humble. But at the same time, sometimes the message gets, gets muddled. When, whenever we minister, one of the things we have to do is we have to make sure that when we minister, if the poem that God gave him glorifies God, he doesn't have to tell people God gave him that. Because people will see God. The salt and light are there. One of the things sometimes we do as Christians is we kind of over-announce ourselves. You know, I just, you know, <laughs> sometimes we do something for somebody and we go, I just want you to know that I did this for Jesus. I want you to know that all of my hard work and all that I did and everything that I slaved for was for Jesus. So you are welcome. When we do that, we're kind of, we're kind of emphasizing ourselves. We're kind of drawing to ourselves. And it's not really being salt and light at that point. Sometimes we just have to let our works shine for what they are without trying to put a spotlight on them. Sometimes people do that. They want to spotlight their works. God wants us to do good works. He wants uh, our good works to shine out for all to see. But He wants them to glorify Him and not us. 
So when we do things, we have to realize sometimes there's things we're going to do and we might never get the credit for them. Sometimes we're going to do things uh, anonymously and we're not going to get that, you know, pat on the back. But if they shine forth and God gets the glory, that's all that matters. And so Jesus wants us to be salt. He wants us to be light. And when Jesus talks about work, he references salt. Number two, Jesus is talking about works in Matthew 5.13, and he references salt. Why would he reference salt with works? And I wondered about that, because, because as, I, as I read this, I said to myself, well, this is kind of interesting, because he talks about salt, and he talks about works, and what does that really have to do with, with one another? But if we look at Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13, God makes an interesting commandment here. It says, season all your grain offerings with salt to remind you of God's covenant. Never forget to add salt to your grain offerings. Season all your grain offerings with salt to remind you of God's covenant. Never forget to add salt to your grain offerings. You know, the offerings were seasoned with salt as a reminder of the people's covenant, the contract with God. Salt is a good symbol of God's activity in a person's life because it penetrates, it preserves, and it also aids in healing. God wants to be active in your life. And if you let it become a part of your life, penetrating every aspect of your life, preserving you from the evil that's around us, He'll heal you of some of our sins and our shortcomings. He'll, he'll take them from us and help us to overcome them. In Arab countries, an agreement was usually sealed with a gift of salt to show the strength and the permanence of the contract. It was, it was something that said, this is a binding contract that's going to last and let this salt be the reminder. That's why he calls us the salt of the earth. Let the salt that you use each day on your table or on your food remind you that you're one of God's covenant people. You actively help preserve and purify the world that you live in by letting God work through you. So you're salt. You're that offering. And this is God's covenant. And now... You're the salt of the earth. You're the one that's going to bring in offerings to God. Offerings of changed lives. Number three. Behold the transforming power of salt. Salt can, can change things. I tell you, it can, it can, it can, it can. I have encountered in my life you tell by looking at me, a lot of bad soups. <laughs> Let me tell you, there's nothing worse than a bad soup. You can tell when, when somebody's got a good soup, and, and I just love soup. I could talk about soup all day. Soup is good food. Campbell's was right. But I, I like it. It's starting to get a little cold now, and when it's cold, Nicole lets me have soup again, so it's really awesome. I could eat soup in the summer, but soup's just summer thing for us. But I like soup. And when, when a soup is really good, people will take a spoon. You know, they kind of do that. you got to kind of cool it down or else you'll get that like burnt skin on the top of the roof of your mouth. <laughs> but you got to cool it down and you sip it. You watch like a restaurant where there's really good soup. People take that first spoon and they just sip it. Oh, that's nice. And then they dig in. And they don't even bother with that. If it's good soup, they don't even bother with the crackers. They don't bother with the salt. But boy, when it's bad soup. <laughs> you, you watch a place with it's bad soup, it's got no flavor. Right away, it's like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Pepper. <laughs> crackers. <laughs> a little bit of my sandwich. <laughs> 
we can cop. We like we got we gotta stick all that stuff in there because if, if it's not good soup, we we gotta save it. And 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 the way to save it is to add some flavor, to add some zest, to add some appeal. And so salt has kind of a transforming power. Because I've encountered some bad soups that a little bit of salt and all of a sudden it's good. Because it had the right stuff in it, but there was just nothing to bring out that flavor. And salt kind of enhances that. Now there's an interesting story about salt in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now the leaders of the town of Jericho voted, visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. This town is located in a beautiful natural surrounding, as you can see, but the water's bad. The land is unproductive. Elisha said, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. He went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it. He assaulted the town spring. <laughs> and he said, this is what the Lord says. That's exactly how he talked. I have made this water wholesome. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And sure enough, the water has remained wholesome ever since, just as Elisha said. <coughs> now, this is kind of interesting because salt usually denotes useless water. If, if you've ever been to uh, the Dead Sea, does anybody know why it's dead? It's full of salt. Now, if you're me and you're obese, when you go into water, it's impossible for you to sink. I am like a gigantic bobber. <laughs> and it's really cool. Because like I'll go to a lake, I'll jump, jump off a boat, and I'll boom, and, and I can just lay there, and I just like, I'm up on the water. People are like, how can you do that? I'm like, well, it's a couple hundred pounds, it's pretty um, But a lot of skinny people, if they don't do anything, if they don't move, they'll go right down. But that's not true in the Dead Sea. In the Dead Sea, everybody's born in. Because that salt will hold you up. That, 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 that'll, that'll hold you up in that water. But here's the thing. <coughs> Don't drink it. You cannot drink that water. That water's bad. And so I believe that there's, there's a spiritual picture here that God is painting. And a lot of times he does that with the prophets. He uses the drama of the prophets in the Old Testament to paint a spiritual picture for us. And, and here's this water that's dead. This water that's stale and it's stagnant and it's useless. They can't even use it to water the land because it's so bad. And what, what Elijah does is he takes that bad soup. He says, bring me a bowl of salt. And he puts it into the water. And as he puts it into the water, all of a sudden, life comes back into that dead water. Life comes back into that dead water. And now that water is useful. You can drink it. You can use it on your irrigation and your crops. You can, you can bathe in it. It's been made wholesome. That's God's purpose for us. A lot of times bodies of water, especially seas in the Bible, uh, they, they tend to represent humanity. And if we're the salt of the earth, we're, we're that seasoning in humanity that's supposed to lead them to life. We need, to be, we need to be focused on winning souls, on winning the lost, on being salt, and on being light. So last thing, the last three things I want to do here is focus on the properties of salt, some of the things that salt does. A, salt enhances the flavor of something that is bland or dull. Salt enhances the flavor of something that's bland or dull. Now, I want to warn you, you can 
get too much salt, and all of a sudden something's ruined. We were going someplace to eat one night, and, and, and the person that was serving us said, well, we don't have any dessert tonight. I'm so sorry, Pastor, but I made an apple pie this afternoon. Well, I got the recipe switched around. I put a cup of salt in and a teaspoon of sugar. And it was nasty. So I threw it away. And too much salt can ruin something. Some believers have a little too much salt. Sometimes, sometimes the, the, the thing is, some of us need to be more outgoing. Some of us need to be more out there and some of us need to witness more. Some of us need to be more restrained. Because too much salt can ruin something. We showed that little thing about Christian ease. Well, there's a thing some believers do, and I, I call it God talking. And, uh, and it is just, it, it, it's a tough thing for me because I grew up in the church. And I grew up not in the church, just going to the church. I grew up as a preacher's kid. So I saw the other side of the church. I saw the reality of the church. And I knew that a lot of times the people that sometimes we'd have testimony services. So, oh, Pastor, I just praise God for you. Your family's so wonderful. And look, we just we're so blessed in this church. I just love everybody here. And the next week I see the same label. When are you going to take care of this situation? You got to get them out of here because they're horrible. And you got, you know, and I'm like, okay, that's wrong. <laughs> I knew something wrong with that. So, so God talks, it tends to bug me because a lot of people just interject things into their language so they sound like Christians. And, and, and I always, I always think when you, when you say something too much and you don't mean it, it's useless. And a lot of times people just go, oh, praise God. Here we go, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And here you go. And a lot of times it really is nothing but a knee-jerk reaction. It's not sincere praise. It's not sincere glory. It's not sincere. And that was one of the things that... We're from Wyoming, okay? And we can get excited. We can jump and we can shout sometimes. <laughs> yeah. See. But I, I am from Wyoming and North Dakota enough that that did kind of scare me. Um, <laughs> see, that's the thing. We're a little more reserved. And uh, I, I, I've had friends that are evangelists that have come up to some of the churches I pastor in North Dakota and Wyoming. And, and uh, they, they get disappointed. They'd be like, what's wrong with your people? What's wrong with your church? Brother, they're dead. And I was like, what's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> I, say, I say, you know, one of the things, one of the things is, you're measuring spirituality by how people act. You can't measure spirituality by the standards of hypocrisy. When I was uh, when I was the DYD and I used to work at camps, uh, I remember one time we had this we had this guy. He was a great speaker. He he came from uh, Southern Missouri and. Uh, he was a great speaker, but we would have worship at night, and some of the kids would come down to the front, they'd be jumping up and down, and they'd be dancing, and, and there'd be other kids sitting in the back like... Mm -hmm. And uh, one night, he got up on the platform, and he just, he said, You kids in the back, you need to get some of what these kids up here have. And the kids up there were all like, Woo! <laughs> the kids in the back were like... So after service is over, I went and talked to him in the back room. I said, I said, you know something? I said, can I tell you something? And I don't want you to take it wrong, but I've watched these kids for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, the kids that are jumping up and down in the front, they're going to go back home. And uh, about a week and a half from now, they're going to be partying getting back together with the girlfriends and boyfriends they broke up with. And they're not going to darken the doors of the local assembly. I said, and there's some of those kids that you're chastising in the back they are sitting there with their arms folded and they're actually soaking in what's going on. 
And some of them are faithful kids. Some of them are going to go into the ministry. I said, you can never judge with your flesh what the Holy Spirit is doing. But we don't just try to judge that with our flesh. We try to manipulate that with our flesh. By being super Jesus-y. And let me tell you something. Super Jesus-y might turn on other Christians who want to play Super Jesus Party with you, but it doesn't turn on anyone in the world. And it doesn't attract the world to us. And we don't even use that stuff when we go someplace and we want something. So I've said this before. When I was, at, when I was in that little church in Springfield, You'd hear them talking, oh, praise God, hallelujah, glory to God, Jesus is doing something mighty, hallelujah, praise Him, I just can't stop praising His name. But the same people afterwards, they'd be a sonic. They'd be like, yes, I'd like a hot dog, and I would like a grape slush, please. And I'll... They weren't like, oh, praise God, I want a Holy Ghost hot dog, hallelujah, I don't want a grape slush, hallelujah, praise Jesus, put some glory in that. <laughs> and why? Because they were communicating to get something they wanted. They weren't just demonstrating what great Christians they were. The people of Sonic. That's one of the things we have to do. We have to be careful not to over salt. Let's use salt. When you use salt, it should bring out the flavor of what you're seasoning. It shouldn't destroy the flavor. And then you only see the salt. 1 Timothy 4, 14-16 says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift you've received. Through the prophecy spoken over you and the elders of the church lay hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who who hear you. Being salt doesn't mean being boisterous. And being salt doesn't always mean getting everyone's attention and getting in everyone's face. Sometimes being salt just means being consistent. It means living a life to where people can look at you and they can see that you live out a Christian standard doesn't have to always scream. And I'm going to tell you this. If you're over salty, people will avoid you. If they know they're going to get a sermon every time they see you, they'll see you walking down the hall and go, Woo, I've got to go somewhere else now. <laughs> but if you have the right amount of salt, if you are salt and light, when your coworkers are struggling, when somebody's needing help, they're going to seek you out. They're going to say, hey, i got a question for you. I want to know if you can help me in this situation. So we need, to, we need to season this world with the love of Christ, with, with the gospel of Christ. We need, to, we need to live it out. Sometimes we need to shout it out. Amen? Amen. Or just, you know, casually out it. But... Sometimes, before we shout it out, we need to live it out. If we're not living it out, we're just shouting it out. You know, make it B. Salt can erase negative flavors and tenderize fish and game bites. Have you ever gotten a bad piece of game meat? Ugh. Man. When I was youth pastor in Alaska, I lived with a guy, and he was he was the pastor, and I lived with him and, and his family. And I ate all my meals with him, and he went up to the Yukon. He was going to get himself a moose that was as big as a house. Well, he did. He killed an old cow. And uh, he had pictures of him skinning that thing, and the fat underneath was just yellow. Oh, yeah. But fortunately for me, he was one of these guys that if you kill something, you eat every bit of it. 
And for six months, we had the gamiest, nastiest moose in the world. Oh. That's awful. He shouldn't have killed that moose. He was killing us for six months. It just, you know. And I tell you, I used a lot of salt and a lot of ketchup, a lot of Tabasco sauce, a lot of anything I could to eradicate that flavor. Oh, it's nasty. But uh, when, when, when you have salt, you can kind of help that situation. My dad, when we lived in North Dakota, he used to fish for walleye all the time. A lot of times he didn't always catch walleye, but sometimes he'd catch one of those big 20-pound northerns. And they're kind of bony, and, and uh, he would fillet them, and he'd fill the sink up, half up full of water, and he'd put a bunch of salt in there. And he'd put, that, he'd put those fillets in that sink overnight. And the next day, Mom would fry them, and you couldn't tell the difference between the northern and the walleye. Just a little bit of soaking in that salt helped take that kind of that nasty flavor out. And sometimes salt can do that for things. Colossians 3, 1 through 10 says, Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, <coughs> set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven... Not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, revealed to the whole world, when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. But now the time has come to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slanderous language, dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. See, a lot of times when we become Christians, we give our lives to Jesus Christ. Some of us are still a little gamey. You know? Got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of, a little bit of the world still in us. And it doesn't, it, for Christians, it doesn't always happen overnight. There's not always this, you know, all of a sudden, you know, yeah, man, I got saved, man. I was like really strung out and walked into a church and I went down to the altar, man, and I said, Jesus, help me. And all of a sudden I popped up and said, hey, anybody got any silly gospel? Uh -huh. <laughs> that doesn't happen. And we need the salt and the light of Jesus Christ. To help us learn how to be salt and light to others. If we don't get that, you know, we're not going to be effective in this world. And that's one of the things we need to do is we need to we need to kind of soak in that light of Christ and in that salt that He has. <coughs> so that we can we can produce that lifestyle that glorifies Him. So we can be like Him. The closer we get to Him. The more he's going to rub off on us. Amen. And then people are going to see Jesus. Mm -hmm. When people start seeing Jesus and not us, then we have become salt and light. But there's a lot of times that we just need to press in. Like those northern fillets, we need to get in the sink overnight with a little bit of salt and let God do some work in us. One of the things, too, we have to do is is if you're really salty and you know a Christian is not salty, you got to love them. And you got to understand, that was probably a time when you were just where they were. Last night I was filming in the, in the back room and doing a thing for a friend. And I got a little green screen. I got these like lights and I put up these big lights when I'm filming and I had the window open. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm sitting there 
looking out the window, and there is this moth out there that is just killing itself. I'm sure by the time I shut the lights off, it was mentally challenged. <laughs> because it was just like... <laughs> because here's this window, and these big lights just, you know, beaming out of them. He's like, got to go to the light. <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, all he wants to do is come to the light. And he's struggling with everything he has, and he can't get to it. Now, I wasn't about to open the window and let him come to the light. Because number one, those lights are so powerful that all of a sudden I smell something burning after a while. But number two, I didn't want him in my house. You stay outside. But I thought about believers when I saw this little mom. Because you know, there's a lot of people out in the world that they want to come to the light of Christ. They want to know Him. And sometimes we stand in the light and we judge them and we don't realize that they are doing the best they can and knocking themselves out. And what we need to do sometimes is instead of standing on the inside <coughs> going, what's wrong with you, boy? Sometimes we need to give them a healthy hand. In a loving way. Not in a way that goes, good, 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 good. But in a way that just says, hey, let me help you. Let me give you a call. Let me give you some encouragement. Let me give you some love. See, salt can preserve and keep a food product edible for a long period of time. Have any of you ever had pemmican? You've had pemmican. Good for you. I had pemmican. I, my dad used to tell me about pemmican because he used to tell me stories about the natives of the Plains natives. I grew up on the reservation. He used to say, yeah, they used to make pemmican because it would last a long time. And, and it had a lot of different things in it that was, it would kind of preserve things, berries and meat. And, and uh, I always wanted to taste it. And then the day I got to taste it, it was kind of nasty. But, uh, but it would sustain you. It was pretty much pure protein. When, when salt comes into play with food, a lot of times salt was used to preserve things. A lot of times they would dry fish out in salt and they would pack it out. There. It would make that dried fish something that was preserved and you could eat for a while. You could hold on to it for a while. As, as believers, we don't, we don't just have a responsibility to share the gospel and to teach the gospel and to live the gospel. But we also have a responsibility to preserve the gospel. One of the things we're combating right now in the world really bad is, is the twisting of the gospel. Men are using the gospel <coughs> to basically promote the object of their affection, which is themselves. We've got a gospel that promotes greed. We've got gospels that promote selfishness. We've got gospels that come. There's a lot of different gospels that you hear preached. And part of our job as Christians is to preserve the truth of the gospel. <coughs> the true gospel is this. Jesus taught us to be self-sacrificing. He said that if you want to follow me, following me isn't, isn't going to be a party every day. It's taking up your cross. <coughs> Sometimes it's laying down yourself. Sometimes it's preferring the other person. <coughs> over yourself. And that flies in the face of everything that the world teaches. The world teaches me, 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 me. And if, if, if you write a book called Laying Down Your Life for Jesus, it might not make the best seller list. If you write one called, you know, Eight Habits of a Successful Christian, you'll probably get there. That's what people want to hear. God wants us to preserve the gospel. One of the ways to do that is to live out the truth of the gospel. To seek the whole counsel of God's word. To spend time in prayer. To develop that relationship with Christ every day. Colossians 2, 6-7 says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. Let your roots grow 
down into Him and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. A lot of people in the church that are dissatisfied. And it's, it's not, and I'm, I'm talking about the church in America. <coughs> I'm talking about this building right here. A lot of people today that, that, that are unhappy. Unhappy usually leads to hobby. You know that? Well, somebody in a church is unhappy, usually it's their hobby. And they go from one church to another church to another church. And they find something here. Uh, I don't like the fact that guy don't tuck in his shirt. I'm going to Victory Christian Center. I don't like the fact that that guy, he, 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 he speaks with a funny accent. I'm going to try the evangelical free church. And you know, they go from place to place to place. And there's always something that they don't like. And you wonder... Number one, how deep their roots are. Because I want to tell you something. You know where a lot of people are ending up today? They're ending up in front of their television sets and in front of their computers. And it's really great because there's a lot of ministers that are on TV and a lot of ministers that, that, that have computer ministries. And, and here's what those ministers never have to do. They never have to have a relationship with you. And here's what you never have to do. You never have to have a relationship with them. You don't have to see all their idiosyncrasies. You just get to know what they say from a pulpit and what they say on TV. You don't know what they're like as people. Unless you get invested in a real body of believers, and unless you grow roots, and unless you have fellowship, you're never going to allow yourself to see... <coughs> that the body of Christ is a family. It's not a drive through It's not a Burger King where you get it your way. It's a family. And I'm going to tell you something about my family. We don't always get along. My brother takes me off sometimes. My mom... She drives me crazy. My nieces, I got a good niece and I got an evil niece. I got a nephew that's, well, I don't even know that he's my nephew anymore. I think he's still living. <laughs> Let me tell you something about it. I love everyone. I love everyone. And even when I'm mad at them, I love them. Even when they upset me, I love them. And here's the cool thing. Even when I upset them, they love me. We can go there for Thanksgiving and fight with everybody for three days. And I'll go back home fuming. And my mom will call me that night and say, Are you coming back up for Christmas? <laughs> That's family. We have roots. Let me tell you something. If you go someplace and somebody drives you crazy, that's not a reason to leave. That's a reason to stick around. Because God wants to teach you something through that person. God wants to teach you something. When, when, when God puts difficult people in our lives, we want to run away and avoid them. And sometimes it's because they're difficult people. But a lot of times it's because we see things in them that we don't like in us. And if we could learn to work through those things in ourselves, we would learn to overcome some of those things in our lives and learn to love them. The kind of people you are afraid of are always going to be the kind of people that surround you. <laughs> I'm a friend named Noel Rosa. He's been here, hasn't he? You guys know Noel? He plays guitar. Little Puerto Rican guy. He's annoying, man. But I love him. He's my family. But uh, Noel has a phobia. 
and, and, and just you know, just be honest with you. He he has a phobia. He has a fear of disfigurement. And so he he said, you know, Troy, there's times when people come down to the altar, and sometimes somebody will bring somebody down who's disfigured, and I just like I'm like, oh Jesus, help me, help me, Lord. He says, I'll put my hand up around them, but I can't. Well, one night at youth group, we had a guy come and speak that was disfigured. He had no hand on one arm. And uh, after, after he spoke, we were all eating at the restaurant, and Noel was having a tough time eating because he was sitting, you know, two people down from him. Here he's got this OCD, and he's afraid of him. The guy walks up to him, puts his stump right on Noel's shoulder, <laughs> and says, hey, brother. I just want you to know your ministry really touched me. And this is what Noel did. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and as soon as that guy left, Noel jumped up, ran to the bathroom, and he was gone the rest of the night. Until the end, he was like, is that guy gone? And I told him that, and I said, you know, Noel, I said, if you want to minister to everybody, that's something you're going to have to work. And God's going to put it in your path until you do. So here's the thing. When people run from place to place, to place <coughs> they're not running from churches and they're not really running from God. They're running from themselves. Yeah. If they could deal with their own situations and deal with what's going on and learn to overcome that, man, then they'd be strong. Then God would use them. The way that they feel like maybe they're not being used. But the Word of God will preserve that in their lives if they'll allow Him to speak. And they will overflow with thankfulness. With thankfulness. If you leave somewhere, if you can't leave with gratitude, no way. Because if everything's right, you should have thankfulness. And there comes a time when God moves you to a different place. Sometimes God will move you to a different body to, to be a blessing in a different place. And when he does it, he'll just be like, you know what, we love this place and we love you and we're just grateful for the time we've had here. God's been this time. When you can leave like that, that's good. That's a time of blessing. And so, that preserving power of God gives us a gratefulness in our heart. When we're walking with him, we're so thankful. We're so happy. God wants to work in your life. God wants you to be solved with our heads. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass anybody this morning. I'll wait till tonight to do that. But I just want to ask if there's somebody here who would say, you know what? I'm not very salty in my life. I want to be salt. I want to be light. I want God to inhabit every aspect of my life so that I can shine His light. I haven't been doing that. Maybe at one point you were shining that light, but maybe you've lost your flavor. Or maybe things have just come in and choked you out, or maybe the cares in this world have gotten you down. You just say, Pastor, this week, would you pray for me that I could manifest the salt and light of God, that I could show forth His glory. If that's you, just slip up your hand real quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Father God, in Jesus' name, I just come to you. Lord, I pray for those who raise their hand. God, that your Holy Spirit would minister to them this week in a special way. Lord, give them back some of the things the enemy stole from them, God. Give them their joy. Give them their peace. Give them their hope. Give them their faith, God. And let them manifest salt and light. Godliness with contentment is great gain, Lord. I pray that you would give us that peace of mind today. Lord, I pray that you'd walk with us today as we go our separate ways. That you'd be with us. Lord, help us always to cherish the grace that you gave to us when you shed your blood on that cross for our sins. Lord, help us to turn from our sins and walk in your righteousness every day. I pray these things in Jesus' name.